The DFL had an ideal election night, flipping 18 seats and will have a 75 to 59 advantage when session begins. What was the DFL's message to voters and why do you think it resonated so well? Well, we really cared about Minnesotans and we went to their houses and talked to them about what was important to them. And we didn't go to Minnesotans saying, here's what we think, isn't it awesome? You know, vote for us. We went to Minnesotans and said, what do you value? What's important to you? And we will make those our values and our agenda at the state capitol. And we truly listened and then our agenda reflected the things that Minnesotans told us they care about. You've been chosen by your caucus to serve as House Speaker. How will you approach this position? With a lot of humility and some good humor. I think you can solve a lot of problems if you don't take yourself too seriously. And if you're willing to make a lighthearted moment where there's a tense situation. I think as speaker, my job is to manage success. It's not to direct what happens, but it is to give the members of my caucus who have leadership opportunities as chairs the space to do really good work and then to um, run interference and solve problems with the Senate and with the governor's office. A little over a month ago, you mentioned that the 2019 legislature would start right away working on unfinished business from last session. What are those issues? Well, there's two different things when I talk about what's the most important work for us to get going on at the Minnesota House this year. First are the Minnesota values that people brought to us. And what Minnesotans really value is building a state that works better for everyone. Right now it's a state that works pretty well for most people. But we need to bring that prosperity to everyone. So world-class schools in every community, affordable health care for every Minnesotan, and then more economic security in families. So that's our highest priorities. In terms of the work that can be done the fastest, there are some little pieces of that omnibus prime, that 990 page bill, that didn't need to be tied up in that colossus and could have been sent on their own and gotten done. And Senator Gazelka and I have pledged to one another to look for those opportunities of little things we can get done early. Kind of in that vein, Republicans hold a slim lead in the Senate, so it's still divided state government. How will you be able to work effectively with Republicans over the next two years? Well, I think what's really important about uh, those of us in elected life is if we look at the job that we have, it's not to just represent the people who voted for us. The job is to represent the people who voted for us and the people who didn't vote for us. So if you take that responsibility seriously, you're always listening to Republican voices as a Democrat or to Democratic voices as a Republican. So I think Senator Gazelka and I will be good partners. I think we both respect one another's point of view and we respect each other as leaders. Governor Tim Walz has called for a gas tax increase to help fix the state roads and bridges. Can we expect the House DFL to push this issue in 2019? Well, we are certainly letting the governor take some time to put his cabinet together, and we're looking forward to him presenting his budget. I think when you look at over the history of the state of Minnesota, when has there been sustainable investment in transportation that really improves the state over an extended period of time? rather than just a brief little shot that does a couple of construction projects, you have to look at sustainable transportation funding. One of the beauties of the way we fund transportation in Minnesota is that the gas tax is constitutionally dedicated and can only be spent on roads and bridges. It can't even be spent on transit. So I think that that's a logical place to look when we look at investing in transportation. Now certainly Governor Waltz ran on this and he won big. So he views it as a mandate and I believe it is. With the projected $1.5 billion surplus in the upcoming biennium, you've urged caution a little bit. Why? Well, in 2002, we took inflation out of our state budget forecast. We use inflation when we look at how much money will be coming in, but we don't look at inflation on all the expenditures. So that means we assume that the cost of asphalt two years from now will be the same as it is today. Well, the way that Minnesotans run their families, they know milk is going to cost more in two years than it costs right now. So if, you're, if your salary stays even over time, you're losing ground because there's this thing called inflation. And we have to recognize that reality in, in the government too. There's about $1.1 billion worth of inflation. So we really have a surplus of $382 million. There will be 34 committees, subcommittees, or divisions this session. Former Speaker Kurt Dowd said that this will make following a bill harder for the public. How do you respond to that? The reason why we have committees on housing and climate and criminal justice reform is those are important areas that weren't being looked at and weren't really being served in the prior two years. And so we needed to create some more spaces for important conversations to happen. I'm really excited to see what will, will happen in our housing committee, our water committee. Uh, criminal justice reform is sort of a magical moment. Uh, Republicans and Democrats on uh, 
both agree that we need to do something on uh, criminal justice reform. So we have to have the space to have those conversations. And I think Minnesotans are a hardworking people. They deserve a hardworking legislature. So this will not be a legislature that runs on Republican banking hours. Uh, we will be working really as hard as Minnesotans work at their jobs. And there's been talk about reforming the legislative process and Representative Gene Pulowski Jr. is chairing a subcommittee in this area. What can Minnesotans expect to see different in 2019 with the DFL in charge? Well, the really important point that Gene Pulowski makes is we have right now a system that has infinite inputs into a finite system. And you can't do that for very long before you run into trouble. Right now, legislators can, pa can introduce as many bills as they would like as though there's no limit to the amount of hearings that we can have. There actually is a limit, and it is the taxpayer's dollar. So I think we have to look at making sure that everything we do is very cognizant of the taxpayer's dollar and that we're really frugal and that we're um, confined in the inputs that we put into this finite system. We have to be realistic at the outset of what can be accomplished in a six-month session and not kind of pretend that we have infinite ability to keep going uh, like a around the year legislature. And finally, years from now, when people look back at the 2019 session, what do you hope they'll remember? I hope that they will see a session that has more bipartisanship and more good humor. When I first started serving in 2005 and 2006, the Democrats and the Republicans were closely divided. And in that type of environment, we found that the way to get things done was to have humility, listen to each other, and to kind of play some practical jokes and lighten up the mood a little bit. And so I hope people will see a lot more transparency, a little bit more fun, a little bit more levity, and people working together.